So, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, we're going to begin there in our study this morning. Now, today I want to talk to you about just how incredibly blessed you are. This is really the, the theme of this first chapter uh, that Paul writes here to this, uh, this incredible church that he spent many years with. He knew this church well. He had spent much time there, many years, and just encouraging them. And now he's writing to them, encouraging them to continue in their faith and to grow and to mature. It's really an incredible epistle because for Paul being in prison, uh, you think to yourself, well, gosh, if I was in prison for on trumped up charges, I'd probably just be bummed out and just be thinking this is a rotten deal, but just the opposite is taking place. He is basically just rejoicing in God's will and purpose in his life as an apostle in verse 1. And then he goes on to describe the incredible blessing of the faithful people that he remembered and just the grace that God had bestowed upon him. And then in verse 3 here, he just breaks into praise. And he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So he just breaks into this incredible praise and thanksgiving towards God. Now, there's a little play on words here that I think is really important to note. He says, blessed be God, and then he turns around and says that he's blessed us. So this is, these are two separate words, two different words, blessed be God and blessed us, but they have the same root uh, word in Greek. Now it's interesting here, one, blessing the Lord is basically praise to him. But when it's in reference to us, it literally means to act kindly toward. And so he has acted in kindness towards us. And so, very important little note. Blessed be the Lord who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Notice that he says here also in verse 3, he says, every spiritual blessing. Everything that you have need of for your spiritual life, he has already given. So everything that, you, that will satisfy you, make you a, a happy Christian, enjoyable Christian life, and ultimately get you to heaven, has already been given. And that's the, the next issue, is that it's past tense, has been given. God has blessed you and given you these things because he wants to just bless your life. He wants to act kindly towards you. So Peter declares the same thing. He says in 2 Peter 1.3, Peter confirms to the believers that as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So notice, all things have been given to you that pertain to life and godliness. So it's already been given. Everything that you have need of, it's yours. This is why Paul also says in 2 Corinthians 1.20, he says, for all the promises of God in him are yes, And in him, amen, or so be it, to the glory of God through us. So he's already said yes to every promise that he's made. Now, is that the way you look at prayer when you come to God in prayer? He's already given to you these things, and he's already said yes to your petition. Or do you say to yourself, no, I've got to twist his arm to get this, or I've got to be good to get this, or I've got to do some 
great thing to get this. How do you see it? Which way do you perceive it? It's very important. And so he has blessed us. And notice these blessings are in Christ. Now, that means that if you want to experience these blessings, you have to be in Christ. You have to be a believer. You have to be a Christian. You can't expect these blessings if you're not in Christ. And if they are in Christ in heavenly places, that means you have to ask for them because they are not here on this planet. They're not in me. They're in him. So I have to be in him and I have to ask of him. I have to fellowship with him if I'm going to experience these incredible blessings. And so, and then last, notice their spiritual blessings. Now, the Bible does talk about material blessings. He talks about the blessings upon, physical blessings like your health. But that's not what Paul is talking about here. So, I'm not saying that these are not blessings because they are. There are incredible blessings from God materially, physically, and in your health. But that's not his topic here. His topic here is spiritual blessings, which is, I think, very important because that means you're still blessed even if you're in prison. Because that's where Paul was, right? He was in prison. And so he still saw himself as blessed in prison. It means that you can still see yourself blessed even when materially or physically you're not doing that well. Your health is deteriorating. Your financial position is not real good. You're still incredibly blessed by God. And so a very important perspective, and that's why he's describing these spiritual blessings that are in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, very important to know exactly what he is teaching here. Now, what are these spiritual blessings that you have in Christ? There are a multitude of them. I'm not even going to go over the majority of them here today. I'm just going to hit a few high points for you. And I, I, in the first verses from verse 4 through 14, what Paul does is he gives seven blessings, spiritual blessings. But there are many more throughout this epistle that he's going to address. And I'll, I'll make note of those when we come to them. Because there are, there are too many to even go over here in this one study. There are many throughout the scripture that are referred to as God's blessings. I'm going to hit a few of those as well. But we're going to come back in our future studies and look at each one of these. So I'm not going to really cover them in depth this morning. I'm just going to hit the high points here for you. And then we'll come back and look at them in specific. So what are these spiritual blessings? Well, the first one is recorded for us in verse 4. He says there, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Wow. Now think of that. He chose you in Christ before the foundations of the world. Before you were ever born. Before your parents were ever born. Your grandparents were ever born. Before anybody was ever born. Before Abraham or before Adam and Eve were, were on this earth. He chose you in him for what? He tells you right there. He says he chose us to be holy and without blame before him in love. He chose me for the express purpose of making me holy. Just like he is holy. And to be without blame. Now I have, I have plenty of things that I can be blamed for. So do you. But in Christ, 
The scripture says you're blameless. Blameless and holy before him. That's why he chose you. That's the purpose that he's working out in your life. Now, if he didn't ordain and choose me to be holy, I could never be holy. It would not happen. But since he has, that means if you're a believer here this morning, you're in the process of being made holy right now. You're in that process. And the work that he begins, he promises that he will what? He's going to finish it. He's going to perfect that which he begins. So isn't that a comforting thought, a blessed thought to think that you're in that process, you're not what you should be, but you're not what you used to be. Okay? Amen. I hear an amen to that. And this is good. And so the process is being accomplished. And one day it will be finished. So just yield. Yield to him and let him do it. Secondly, in verse 5, he says, Having predestined us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So this is the good pleasure of his will that he would predestine me before the foundations of the world to be adopted as his son or daughter. So he has always planned on adopting me into his family. In fact, there is no way that I could ever expect to be in his family apart from his adoption. Why is that? Well, it's simple. The scripture says that I was his enemy. You don't adopt enemies into your family, do you? I mean, nobody on this planet would do that, right? You, you just you want to get to know your, these children before you adopt them, and you love them, and you adopt them into your family because there's, there's chemistry there. But I'm an enemy of God, yet he adopts me into his family. So there's no way that I could be adopted apart from this action by him. Third, you've been accepted by him. Because you are in the Beloved. In fact, that's the only place you can be accepted by Him is because you are in the Beloved. He says there, to the praise of the glory of His grace. And that truly is the whole point of accepting me and choosing me and adopting me into His family is so that I can be to the praise of of His glory and His grace as men see the transformation He makes in our lives. By which He made us accepted in the Beloved. And so, He has accepted me. There is no way that I could be accepted by Him if I were not chosen and accepted by Him because of my sin. My sin the scripture says, has alienated me from the life of God. That's later in the book of Ephesians. So if I have been alienated from his life, how could I ever be accepted by him? It's only by a work of his grace. That's it. There isn't any other way that it could be accomplished. And so he has accepted me. And he has forgiven me for my sin, which takes me to number four. He says there in verse seven, he says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. In him we have redemption. Now this word redemption is a slave market term. It's a term that means to purchase someone out of a slave market 
and to purchase, to provide the purchase price and then to loose them, to loose the, the chains that are holding that slave. That's what the word means. And so this is what, how Paul sees his salvation as being loosed from the penalty of sin and from the power of sin. You see, that is how we've been made free or set free. And so I could never have done enough to be forgiven of my sin unless he chose to forgive me and to loose me. There's no way that I could ever muster up enough energy and willpower to ever set myself free from the, the power of my own sin nature within me. I mean, Romans chapter 7 makes that pretty clear that Paul understood he had a will to do what was right. But he said, I don't find the power to do it. And then the glorious chapter 8 of Romans where he declares the law of the, sin, of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And he set me free. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And so an incredible blessing that has been bestowed upon us that we would be redeemed. I could never have worked myself free from my own sin. There is no way. But he has done it. And then verse 9 he tells us the fifth incredible blessing upon us. He says, Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. And so he made known to me the mystery of his will. Again, I could never have known these truths unless he made them known to me. I look at it this way. How many times did it take for someone to share the gospel with you before you actually heard it? You really heard it and understood it. I had numerous people share the gospel with me and it would just go whoop, right over my head. I'd say, doesn't make sense. I'm not interested in this. I don't want to hear this. Leave me alone. And then one day, someone spoke the, the word of the truth of the gospel and it was like a sword that went right straight through my heart. And I, I went, this is what I need. This is what will change my life. And what is that? It's an act of grace. That's what it is. It's a total act of grace. Opening your eyes, making known to you these truths that only he could do. Why? Because I'm blind. It's that simple. Spiritually blind. And that's what Jesus came to do, is to open the eyes of the blind, to allow the captive to go free. And that's, that's you and me. And then, verse 11, he tells us the next spiritual blessing. He says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things. And that word works there is in the present tense. He is continually working all things according to the counsel of his will. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. And so we have obtained an inheritance, an eternal inheritance. So different from a material inheritance inheritance. Many of you have received material inheritances. You know, when someone in your family dies. And all it is, it's temporary. Because one day, you're going to die. 
And you're going to have to pass on that in your inheritance on to someone else and to someone else. It's all temporary. But there is an eternal inheritance. And that eternal inheritance is given to you today, which is the presence and power of His Spirit in your life, the Spirit of Christ living inside of you, which then enables you to enter the kingdom of God and heaven itself and the eternal rewards, the eternal inheritance that is awaiting for you. And so I could never have gotten to heaven to experience that unless he redeemed me and he forgave me and he set me free and he released me and made known to me these truths. It's just an impossibility. And so these are the things that Paul focused his attention upon, this eternal inheritance. When you're in a prison cell chained to a Roman soldier, you're going to think about eternal things, not material things. And then seventh, in verses 13 and 14, he says, In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee or the pledge or the security deposit of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Isn't it interesting he uses this, this another slave market term here, the purchased possession. That's what you are. That's what I am. I am a purchased possession of him. And he then sets me free to allow me to live as he has always intended me to live. As someone who is free to now worship him as I have always, he has always purposed that I would. So he sealed me, marked me with the Holy Spirit of promise. We're going to look at this in, in depth in a few weeks, but the issue here is that he has marked me as, and to identify me first as a Christian, as a believer, as his, by filling me with the Holy Spirit. And that is the mark, that's the proof, that's the way you know someone is truly a believer. And you can tell. You, you walk up to somebody, you can start talking to them, and you can just tell, I think this person is a believer. Why? Because I sense the life and the joy and the love of Christ in them. And when you sense that, you realize this, this, they are His. But also, it's not just an identification mark. It is a mark of security. You see, because apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, I'll tell you, I, I, we're not going to make it. I need power to live the Christian life. And so, this is what enables me to do what He commands me to do. So when a person says, oh, I can't do that. Well, you can do that. You can do it in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can. And if you choose to surrender to His Spirit, He will enable you. He will empower you to walk with Him. And so I could never get to heaven unless He filled me with His Spirit. I could never get there because I need His keeping power, His strengthening power in my life. And this, this is why you need to wait upon the Lord. You need to be open to His Spirit, yielded to His Spirit, pursuing His Spirit in your life. That should be the first thing that you pray about every day is, Lord, I surrender to You today. Fill me with Your Spirit and empower me to follow you. So these are the seven blessings that he begins with here in this first chapter. And yet there are many other blessings. Let me give you a few more. 
There is salvation itself. In Psalm chapter 3, verse 8, there David declares, Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Notice that he describes salvation itself as just being God's blessing. Every one of these seven blessings that I've just gone over to you is incorporated in salvation and what salvation entails. In Psalm 24, 5, David again says, He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. And so David describes the incredible blessing of God's righteousness that he gives to us, that he imputes to us. Paul describes this in Romans 3 and 4 as being the key that establishes you on that solid ground, that solid rock of Christ. Because it enables you to realize, I don't have to try and be righteous enough to get into heaven. In fact, I can't be righteous enough to get into heaven because I have way more sin than I have righteousness. I think more evil than I ever think of righteousness. Right? You, I know what goes through your mind because it goes through mine. And every time I realize, I just say, Lord, thank you for the righteousness of Christ. I don't have to be good enough to get into heaven. You give me the righteousness of Christ by faith. What a blessing is that? Another great spiritual blessing that he has bestowed upon us. And then another blessing, eternal life is described as a blessing. Psalm 133 verse 3. There David, again speaking of the blessing of the unity among the brethren. He says, it is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. And then he declares what it is. Life forevermore. What an incredible blessing is eternal life. I mean, you know, if somebody told you, you know, I'm going to give you eternal life right here on planet Earth right now, you'd go, do I really want that? I don't think I want to live here in this life with all of the trials and the struggles and the evil in this world. I don't want to live here forever. This is the last place I want to live forever. I want to live forever with him in a new heaven and a new earth, in a new body. That's that's what I'm looking forward to. And then... The continual outpouring of the Spirit upon your life in Isaiah 44, 3 is described as a blessing. He says, I will pour water on him who is thirsty. If you're spiritually thirsty, he said, I will pour this living water on you. And he says, floods on the dry ground. So it'll be like a flood on your parched heart. He said, I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. Now, I know we've spoken already here about the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. I bring this up because this is the the desire and the will of God. He speaks about it here in the Old Testament. He speaks about it in the New Testament. It is the key to the life that you want to experience and, and, and the life that you want to have in Christ. It results by the empowering and infilling and overflowing of the Spirit. And that is what His blessing entails. And so it begins there and it will end there. His Holy Spirit. Now, Next, many times when I talk about these blessings, you know, people say, well, hey, you know, Steve, if I'm so blessed, you know, and God has blessed me so much, how come I'm not experiencing it? I'm not experiencing very many blessings. 
Now, I don't know you personally. You're the only one who knows the, the, your own heart. And I want to ask you this morning, how much of these blessings are you experiencing? I mean, are you at rest in what God is doing in your life? Are you rejoicing in what he's doing? Or are you, do you say, gosh, you know what? I, I, I'm not experiencing a whole lot of this, Steve. What's the problem? What's the matter with me? If you're experiencing what you think you should be, then great. Because I'll tell you, there's more. There's always more. And that is something that I think is clear. And so what is it that's keeping? Those of you that are not experiencing his blessings, why? Let me give you several reasons why. First, some believers just simply don't know about these blessings because they are not in the Word of God. They are not studying the Scripture. They rarely open their Bible. So you are not even going to be exposed and have the possibility of knowing these blessings. And later on in this same chapter, chapter 1 here, verse 18, Paul says in Ephesians 1.18, God wants to open the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And so God wants to open the eyes of your understanding. And your understanding is the key because you can know truth, you can hear truth, but you have to understand the truth. You have to receive the truth. Until you understand it, you cannot receive it or live it and experience it. And so many, I believe, just simply don't know what they can possess and what they do possess in Christ. Secondly, some believers just don't believe that these blessings are really for them. They think, no, I, I'm too bad. I, I've, I've done too many evil things. Uh, I'm kind of like a second-class Christian, and I, I'm not like you guys. I've had people say that to me. They look me straight in the face. Well, I'm not like you, Steve. You know, like I'm some superior Christian to them. I go, well, you are. If you're in Christ, you're just like me. You're just like every other believer. And these are blessings for you. They are yours. In Christ Jesus, as I already read, all the promises of God are yea, yes, and amen in him. If you're in him, that's the reality. And so when a person doesn't believe that these things are really theirs, that's unbelief. And unbelief will keep you from experiencing anything from the Lord. Remember in James chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, he said, you have to come to God in faith. And he said, if you don't come to God in faith, he said, let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. So that's an incredible warning. Faith is critical. I have to believe that this is something that God wants to do in my life. In Matthew 13, verse 58, referring to Jesus, Matthew declared, He did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, where is the there? Well, Jesus went to his own hometown of Nazareth. And it says, He did not do any miracle or mighty deed there because of what? They, they sneered at him. They mocked him. They did not believe. And so they missed out. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, the, the Son of God who every place he went, he did miracles. But there, he did none. Wow. I don't, I don't want to be a Nazareth. I don't want to have that kind of heart. I want to have a heart 
that believes that what he has said is for me. And then thirdly, some believers don't even ask for these blessings. If you don't believe, then you don't usually ask. But if you believe, then you should ask. And you have to ask in faith. James 4.2 said, says there simply, you have not because you ask not. You do not have because you do not ask. Such a simple thing. And yet, do we ask? Do we ask continually? Jesus said, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. This is his promise. And then fourth, other believers are simply just focused on the wrong things. They're focused on other things that are really not going to bless them. They're thinking about material blessings or some other thing. Jesus referred to this in the parable of the sower in Mark 4:19. And he said there that the cares of this world or literally the anxieties of this world or he said the deceitfulness of riches and riches are deceitful because we think, oh, if I just had this, I'd be happy. But it doesn't bring any kind of spiritual happiness. And then he says, not only the deceitfulness of riches, but the desires for other things. And other things, you know, just kind of leaves the, the door open because it's, you know, it's you fill in the blank kind of a thing. You know, I've seen people that they're, they're, they're adrenaline junkies. They, you know, they, they, ha they think that, oh, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. I've got to have this experience and that. And this is what they're after. Or they're after, you know, they're, they're focused all on their hobbies. Or they're focused all on sports. Or they're focused all on something other than the Lord. And so you can just kind of fill in the blank there. What is most important to you? If Christ is most important to you, then you should take the action that proves that that is the case. I find that many times people get angry at the Lord. They, they think, well, you know, where are all these blessings that he's supposed to be given to me? And yet they're focused on the wrong thing or they're captivated by ang the anxieties of this world or finding riches and material wealth. And they're focused on the wrong thing. And so those blessings are not going to come. And they think that, you know, God is not responding. Well, God is waiting for them to respond to him. But what happens if you do have the right perspective? You do fix your attention on the spiritual things. What, what is going to take place in your life? The first thing is that it's going to bring about exactly what Paul is doing here. It's praise. You see, Ephesians 1.3 declares, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the Lord. You see, I'm going to be blessing Him. I'm going to be praising Him. Giving thanks to Him. If I truly see what he has blessed me with, I am going to praise him. I'm going to worship him. I'm going to bow my knee to him. In Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2, there it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, or I would add, and his blessings. Forget not all his benefits and blessings in your life. You see, if I have not forgotten those, then I will be praising him. Secondly, a person that knows 
how blessed they are is going to be brought to a place of surrender. This is demonstrated by Paul's acknowledgement in Romans 12, 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Now the mercies of God are what we've just gone over here this morning. The incredible spiritual blessings that he has bestowed upon each of us. Those mercies have been bestowed upon you. And so he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. He wants a living soul. He wants a living person to offer and present themselves to him. This word present here is a Greek word that means to yield to or to uh, another way to translate this is to stand near. Now you think to yourself, I get yield, you know, to present yourself and yield yourself, but to stand near. You know where that picture comes from? I studied this. It's very interesting. It literally means the servant who stands next to the king has presented himself there to stand near to do whatever the king commands. That's what it means. To present yourself. Say, here I am. Send me. Here I am. What would you have me to do? That's what he's referring to. So if you see the incredible blessings that he has bestowed upon you, the benefits that you won't forget, the mercies that he has bestowed upon you, then you will present yourself as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You will see what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God in your life. You'll see it. You'll experience it. You'll walk in it. And so today, I want to encourage you. I mean, would you, will you just praise him? Will you thank him for what he has bestowed upon you? So this morning, after we pray, we're just going to wait on the Lord and take some time to worship this morning. And I hope that you'll meditate upon these truths and let them sink down in your heart and touch, touch you and transform your attitudes, your goals in life. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, thank you so much that, Lord, you have given to us so much. Lord, we don't deserve it. I surely don't deserve it. And yet, Lord, you have given to us great and precious promises that we can partake of all of the blessings that you desire to bestow upon us. And Lord, I pray that you would bring us to that place of surrender this morning. Touch our hearts. Bring us to that place of bowing our knee willingly. Lord, may we present ourselves, may we stand near to you, ready to do what you ask us to. Lord, I pray that you would bring this about in each one of our hearts here. And Lord, for any that are resistive or otherwise minded, Lord, I pray that you would, you would bring everything into the submission, every thought into submission to the will of God. Lord, bring that work to pass in each of our souls here this morning. And if you're here today and you're, you're not following Him, you're not walking with Him, Maybe you've never ever heard the gospel before. This is the first time you really have heard the message of the gospel. Will you respond? I want to encourage you to respond. 
these blessings can be yours if you will surrender yourself to Him. The Scripture says, as many as received Him, He gave the the power to become children of God. So you have to receive Him. You have to receive Him by faith. And you do that by acknowledging your sin, asking His forgiveness, inviting Him to come in and take over your life. If you want to do that this morning, I want to lead you in prayer right where you sit. I encourage you, respond to Him. You have to ask. He will not force His way into your life. If you want to do that, pray with me right now. Just say, Lord, I am a sinner. I have broken your law. Forgive me. Jesus, come in. Take over my life. I surrender myself to you. I put my trust in you. I want to follow you. If you prayed that prayer this morning, I want to encourage you to make a confession here. Acknowledge, yes, I prayed with you, Steve. By just simply raising your hand here as a simple acknowledgement. Yes, Steve, I prayed with you today. Anyone here? We would like to pray for you and encourage you. Father, thank you so much for your incredible blessing of goodness and grace and mercy. May we always acknowledge your, your greatness and your goodness and the gifts that you have bestowed upon us. May we do that even now. In Jesus' name, amen.